Francis and Lisa Chan want people to see their lives in light of eternity. They co-wrote You and Me Forever after spending their 20th wedding anniversary in East Africa. You and Me Forever is now a Right Now Media original. Francis is the best-selling author of Crazy Love and Forgotten God. Lisa is featured on the True Beauty series. Please welcome Francis and Lisa Chan. We're just in the back watching the comedian, you know, and he told that African-American barrel joke. And I started laughing and she has no clue. And, and we're walking up here and she goes, oh, I, I don't get it, like, what's a cracker? <laughs> uh, you are, you know, so this is, uh, <laughs> so she learned something tonight, so. Yes, I don't, I don't mind, that's fine, I can be a cracker. That's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm thinking, wow, it's so funny that you can go so many years and just not know something like that. Um, but yes, we are <laughs> happy to be here with you guys. <laughs> I just was saying it to him today as we were driving in the car, like, we've lived a lot of life. You know, I'm one of those people that's excessive on the talking or whatever that line was that they were talking about. Uh, but I was just telling him, yeah, we've lived a lot of life and we've seen so much and done so many things. We just, we have so much to be grateful for. Uh, we've been married for 25 years this last January. Um, we have seven kids. Our oldest is married and we do have a one-year-old grandbaby. Um, Francis wears a grandpa shirt, and I haven't brought myself yet to wear the grandma shirt, but <laughs> I'm sure I will eventually. Um, but Francis is going to start us off tonight, right? Yes. <clears throat> I thought you would talk about more of our kids. Oh, why should I? Well, I mean, because we're, we're you we know. Have so, so many of them? Um, well, okay. So our, we have four that are still at home. Our youngest is four and a half years old. <laughs> So he's only three years older than our grandbaby. Um, so thankfully, the other day, I took the two of them to McDonald's, and this woman said to, to Silas, my little guy, my son, like, oh, you're out with your mommy and your sister? And I was just like, yeah, isn't that nice? <laughs> I just didn't have the heart to tell her, like, oh, actually, I'm the Grammy. But I'm super happy. I love being her Grammy. Um, and we have, okay, all right. Okay. So, I, I just needed another second to collect my thoughts, so, okay, that was good. Um, you know, I just got back from Africa, like, two, three days ago, so, if I fall asleep while she's talking, that is not, it's just because of that. But, um, I had the honor of, uh, Sunday, I, I did a wedding in Africa. And um, it was so cool. In fact, I think there's a slide of the gal, or maybe not, because I don't know if my assistant got it here. Oh, there she is. Okay, this is, her name is Sige, and uh, she, um, when she was six years old, she was sold by her parents to a witch doctor, and... Um, and she was just abused in so many ways and pimped out and, uh, until she was like 12, 13 years old. And then she ran away. And, uh, and there's nowhere to go there in East Africa. And she ends up in the red light district, only place where she could survive and just selling her body for a dollar per guy every night, several times a night. And then our ministry came in and uh, started talking to her about Christ and pulled her out of there. And, and you know, uh, they educated her, you know, and, 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 uh, and she, she falls in love with Jesus. And, and the last time we were together in the red light district, she was walking through with us, ministering door to door at, uh, you, you know, or whatever you call that, to, to every single prostitute in there. And, 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 and so Sunday to, to be there, I was there with one of my, our daughters and, and to do 
that wedding and to stand there and see her in that white gown, so beautiful, and her bridesmaids and the others that, that had come out of that lifestyle and now were so in love with Jesus. I can't tell you what an honor that is. And uh, the night before the wedding, my, my daughter, Mercy, who was with me, she goes, Dad, when I think about this wedding you're about to do, she goes, I, I, I think about Psalm 62. And I just like nod my head. I go, yeah, I didn't know what Psalm 62 was. But <laughs> I can't let her think she knows more scripture than me. But she starts, uh, she starts quoting it. And I thought, this is so beautiful. I, I would just like to read it as we get started. It says in Isaiah, did I say Psalm? I said, it's Isaiah 62, okay, that's how little I knew this passage. Isaiah 62, and this is what she said. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land married, for the Lord delights in you. And your land shall be married, for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And I just read that on her wedding day of just, you're not going to be named desolate or forsaken anymore but you're this you're this crown jewel in his you know in, in his crown and, and 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 God delights in you and and as I'm reading that I'm just I, I was just thinking about gosh it's not just her story that's that's a story of so many of us that maybe grew up and we were forsaken and everything else and now to think that as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall God rejoice over you and the thought that there's this being up there that's so amazing holy terrifying and yet he delights in me like to really understand that he delights in me and that that he called he says I, I delight over you I I uh, rejoice over you like a groom would rejoice over his bride it's like when you get that when you really believe that, there's, there's so much joy in that. I mean, just the thrill. Uh, you know, then you, you, you look at Ephesians 5 when he's, you know, he says, man, this is a profound mystery. And he says, I'm not talking about marriage here. I'm talking about Christ and the church, how we could become members of his body, that somehow we become one. So there's this God in heaven that God says, if, if you were to look at me right now, you would die because I dwell in unapproachable light. Then Ephesians says that somehow I'm a member of his body. So he nourishes and cherishes. So somehow I'm connected to him right now. Like I'm an extension of him. And he says, I, I, just like my arm is an extension, it's a part of me that God Almighty looks at me in that way. It's like when you get that, there's such a joy and a security that then you go into marriage overflowing, overwhelmed with this relationship. And then you come into this not so needy. Not like, oh, I need you because I'm so depressed and I, I just can't live without you. But instead, it's like, I am blown away by who I get to be a part of. I'm one with him, united with him. And what we have found in marriage, it's, it's when we find so much security. When we're, we wake up every day in awe, like, I can't believe you said that about me. God, I can't believe you delight in me. You delight in me and you call me a member of your body and you and I are one. Then it's like, what do I need from this? Instead, I'm a giver now because of everything that God's given me. And I, I just, I love, you know, learning about marriage and, and learning about how to communicate better. But at the core of everything has to be 
you being a, a, an individual who is blown away that you are one with God, that is going to bring more into your marriage than anything else. Um, can you find the Joshua passage? Did it choose you? Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking there's so much we can get caught up in with a marriage night trying to practically figure out even just the practical steps we just learned. Like they're so meaningful and so good, but unless they are anchored in something a lot bigger than us, they aren't gonna cut it. And when we were reading through the Old Testament as a church, I was so struck with um, Joshua when he, you know, we all know the story, the Israelites, God's people, they're just up and down and up and down. And he gathers them all at Shechem here in Joshua 24. And he's recounting again, like, look at what God has done for us. Don't forget. Look what God has done. He's been so faithful. He's brought us through so much. So I just picture him there, and he's got the whole crowd. And, and I was thinking in my heart, there's a lot of people listening tonight. God, this is a huge, like, I don't want to mess this up. And I want to say something that's meaningful. So what would I, what would I say? You've given me this opportunity and I'm thinking, thinking about gathering all the believers over this whole, well, the states, but the world. This, the question is still the same, or the statement, what Joshua says. Choose you this day whom you will serve. He even says here, uh, mm -mm -mm. nope. Okay, right here, because he's... He's going through the whole account of what God has done. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served, that's fine. If you want to serve someone else, that's fine. If you want to go after the world, that's fine. If you want to re repeat the patterns of your family and your moms and dads who have just divorce and enmity and strife and dissension, if you want to go after all of that, that's your choice. But choose you this day. Because for those of you who say, I will follow the Lord, I choose him then it makes your marriage completely different. Your marriage is not for you. Your marriage is for God. And if you have chosen to say, God, yes, I will follow you, then your marriage will look very different. You will make very different decisions. You know what? You will say, we can't fight. We can't fight. There's another passage I want to share, but I don't know if you have something right now. Oh, go for it. In <laughs> Philippians... <laughs> Philippians 1, can you find that for me? Yes, yes, yes. He's so much faster than I am. I have to like, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and that's how I find it. Um, Philippians 1, starting in verse 27. Um, it's, again, it's like his heart just trying to, I just sense him not begging, but like, come on, like that's my spirit tonight. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You guys, that is it. Only let your life be lived in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Look at what he has done for us. Don't forget. Because listen, I know we are selfish. And it is so easy to just think of ourselves and live in a manner that is not worthy of the calling that we have received that's why we have to stir one another up. We have to read this word so we remember what anchors us. No, I've already chosen. I've already chosen, Lord. There's a witness against me. I have said yes to you. I will follow you. I will follow your word. So what does he say to us? So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Does that describe your marriage at all? 
Are you striving side by side for the gospel? Do you have one mind and one heart? You guys, that's the only thing that will rescue you. It's the only thing that will keep you from running after every other thing that the world and the enemy is just trying to do. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You know, it was like several years into our marriage where I realized, gosh, we don't, we don't fight a lot. And we kind of assumed we would because we were both like off the charts when you take all those tests of like domineering and, and that was us. And, and what we realized was a lot of it is because we we're always pursuing something. You know, the striving side by side, like there was a point to our marriage. The point was not, let's make each other happy, but that we actually have something on the earth to accomplish together. You know, it's like a, that sports team that's going after the championship. Like right now, the Warriors on their way to win, the, you know, their third championship. And, and the idea is, is like, as you're pursuing that, this unity happens, right? And so, so when they win, there goes to be this big celebration. Everyone's going to be hugging each other. But it's not like they sit in the locker room and hold hands and talk and try to become close. It's, it's the byproduct of being on a mission together. And I, I, I think about um, 1 Corinthians 7, which I doubt many people use for a marriage conference. But... Uh, what, what Paul says, this is what I mean, brothers, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, <clears throat> let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. What is Paul saying there in 1 Corinthians 7? He's saying, look, this life is short, this time that we're in. There, there, there needs to be an urgency. He says, so if you're married, there's a sense in which you should live as though you're not. Like, like there's a mission here that you don't want to get so sidetracked by this. That he goes, what you want, what Paul's desire was, was, was understanding eternal things, understanding the times. He's saying, look, you, you've got to have this undivided devotion to the Lord. And so in our married life, it's like, okay, how do we stay focused on this undivided devotion? Because he doesn't want us just you know, communicating all the time and enjoying us. You know, even when we were writing, we are like, gosh, we have a lot of friends that have a great marriage, but a worthless life. Like, what are they actually accomplishing? What are they doing? You know, they're just hanging out, playing with their kids. Like, man, don't we see the end is near? Don't we know that right now, and again, I'm a little passionate about this because I just got back from Africa and seeing some of the crazy things that are going on. And as, as some of you know, we, we went uh, 20 years ago, I mean, not 20 years ago, five years ago, at our 20-year anniversary. And I, I want to show you this slide of, of this gal, um, this picture of this, this little girl, and uh, uh, the one before that. Yes. Okay, so we were blown away at uh, just what was still going on. And, and heartbreaking. And so it's like, we got to do something about it. So writing the book, we, you know, built, built a medical clinic through it, you know, uh, got some land to build a um, women's home for people in the, the red light district. But that second picture now show the other one the, of the other gal. That's the same girl like a few months ago when I went and visited her. 
See, like that's, that's the stuff that brings life into our marriage. It's like, man, look what we got to do. Like, like we, we celebrate. She's one of thousands of kids that have gone through this clinic now and we're feeding and caring for them. I got to visit that last week and just, just see over 100 people coming through there every day. And go, man, we, we got to be a piece of that. And at the same time, um, going to the next slide, uh, I, I also, yeah, it's marriage night. So, uh, but we, I went into this camp just a, a few days ago with about 50,000 people, okay? And, and uh, there might be one more slide, maybe not, yeah. So these are just 50,000 displaced people and so we were able to buy see those blue tarps on there. That was just to cover them because the rainy season was coming, you know. And, and right when I got there, there was a, a woman just going. She was hysterical. And uh, no one could calm her down. And I looked a few feet away from her was her, her dead son, um, who was literally skin and bones, just like that other girl that we saw, except he was dead. And this girl was just going nuts. And I'm thinking, man, they're burying like five people a day. And so there's just this urgency as I, I hear this woman screaming and I'm looking and I'm looking at 50,000 people. And it's like, okay, okay, we got some tarps. Okay, can we get stoves for them? Can we get food over here? Because it only costs like 20 cents a day. 20 cents a day to feed a person over there. And yet, but when you multiply that by 50,000, and then I can start thinking, oh, it's just one camp, and there's, there's like 20 of these camps. It's like, but that's right before my face. I've got to do something about it. And I was telling my daughter, it feels really kind of sick to be on our end of things. And I, I said, it feels like those gladiator movies where you just decide live or die. Like, like I have power over that. I decide how many thousands of people live or die based upon my financial decisions and what I spend my time doing and what I talk about. And so, so I get home from that. I'm like telling my wife, like, hey, we've got to figure this out. We've got to do something. Like, and, and, and it's, the idea is like we could just sit and enjoy life and everything else, but the reality is there really are people dying apart from Christ. And the thrill to me is, gosh, it's such a long story, but we, we, we've hired like 40 pastors, you know, for like $5 a day, which they're thrilled about, to go and pass out food, you know, at these camps and share the gospel at the same time. And, and it's like, okay, we've got to get it to more. We've got to get it to more because I don't want any of them dying. I don't want to, you know, there's so much to say. But, but my point is, this is life for us. And, and as we pursue these things together, as we try to figure out solutions, it's like the, the unity in our family you know, the way our kids are, it's like, again, we, we kind of look back and we're surprised because our kids love each other so much. They, they, they love the family so much. They love Jesus so much. And we're not a family. I mean, sad, like I should have done a better job with devotions and everything else, but I've never been good with all of that. But as we've pursued the mission together, it's crazy, like the byproduct of it was this amazing marriage and amazing unity between Lisa and I and with the kids. And so again, like all the other tools are great, but at the core, if this isn't right, and the two of you don't see yourself as having a purpose on the earth and pursuing a mission together, then what's the point? And it's really, as you seek him and as you seek his mission, the byproduct of that is this incredible relationship that, I mean, one of the joys was a few months ago at our 25 year anniversary, you know, we're at dinner and, and Lisa just goes, um, I forgot your exact words, but you're, you're like, honey, do you think there's anyone happier than us on the earth? 
She goes, I, I keep thinking, like, there's got to be someone. I've just never met them. You know, like, there's got to be someone. She goes, I just feel like it's been too much. Just so, so blessed, so, so happy. And we're just envious, you know, like, like we want others. To, that's not the right word. We're jealous for you to, is that the right word? All right. Why don't you say something? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when it says taste and see that the Lord is good, it's like we go to a great restaurant and we want to tell everyone about it. And we've got everybody in our city going to House of Pancakes. Like, it is the most amazing Chinese food. And I don't even like Chinese food because I'm a cracker. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, it's very rare that I make him laugh, so this is good. I'm not the funny one in the family. Oh, but you know, taste when you taste and see the Lord's goodness, you do, you want everyone. It's like you want to convince, like, trust me, you know. You gotta do it the Lord's way. You've got it off you've got to offer an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. It's this isn't about whether or not you guys think you have a great marriage. This is about what does God think? Does God look at our marriage and say, yes, that is a marriage that is acceptable in my sight. That is what I have asked for. Because he has always been a God who requires a certain thing. If you haven't read the Old Testament in a while, it's very clear. We're reading in Leviticus right now. It's like, wow, I want the, the offering offered exactly this way with exactly these things and with exactly this kind of fire. And this is exactly what the priest will wear. And when things are not offered the way God wants them to be offered, there is not the blessing of God. And many times there is discipline. And so our heart is to save you from that. To say, don't listen to any other voice but the Lord's voice. And remember to ask yourself, is God pleased with our marriage? Is God pleased with me as a wife? When you sit alone in the presence of God with the word of God and you say, show me, Lord, show me. Am I pleasing to you? Am I loving my husband the way that you want me to? Because that changes things, doesn't it? Lord, am I showing the humility that you died to give to me like you died to give your spirit to me that your spirit would reside in me that I might exemplify the fruits of the spirit so am I showing the kind of humility in my marriage do I have a forbearing spirit towards my husband towards my wife am I am I offering the forgiveness of Christ always Man, it just changes everything, you guys, when we, when we offer the sacrifice that the Lord wants and we remember that that's right, it, this isn't about you and me. This is about what does God want? Because the beauty about that is, of course the Lord's heart is that both of you would be there. But the beauty is that you can offer the sacrifice whether or not your spouse ever does. You can say, I will. I have chosen the Lord. I will walk in obedience. And I will let him reveal when I am not honoring him the way that he wants me to. We got like a minute left. Uh, I just want to say like the thrill of, I know we, we've said so many different things and we're so passionate about this. And I, I'm also just in my mind, I'm just thinking it's just, is so not fair in so many ways that we can sit here and have these marriage talks and everything else, and yet my mind is still thinking about that mom that's going nuts today because another child died, another child died, and, and it's, it's the joy, though. I, I hope you see that. It's the joy of going, gosh, look at that little girl. She was supposed to die, and now look at her. I'm, I'm playing hide-and-seek with her. I'm, I mean, the joy of that. And, 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 and to do a wedding of, man, that was one of those girls in the red light district who, who spent her life just being rejected and, and desolate and abandoned, and look at her. She's a 
beautiful bride with a beautiful godly husband now. Like those are the things that so fill us up. And then when we see our kids grow up and they go out there and look at what Justin and Rachel are doing, you know, look at what Mercy's and look at, you know, it's like these are the things in life that so many people miss out on. And we don't want you to miss it because marriage can be so beautiful when you realize it's, it's not just about this. There's such a bigger picture. We are connected to him. And one day we are going to stand before him and to hear those words, well done, for him to say, yes, my delight is in you. Um, we look forward to that. That's why our book was all about, you know, marriage in light of eternity. Because too often when we talk about marriage, we just think about here and now, and it can become a very selfish thing. And what scripture says is when you lose your life, when you let go of, you know, I don't even care how I live on this earth, you end up being blown away at the joy and the blessing you can have right here. Um, gosh, one last thought, because I know the time's up. Uh, that verse earlier, what Lisa said about, or not Lisa, it was Apostle Paul, about striving side, side, uh, side by side, just having one mind. You guys, I really just believe the, it sure feels like the end is getting close. And God wants a unified bride. Um, and there's so much fighting and bickering in the Christian world. Uh, you know, everyone's accusing and trying to disassociate. And I remember like five years ago, everyone was like, oh, Francis Chan, he's a poverty gospel preacher. You know, he thinks everyone has to be poor. And then like a few months ago, they're like, oh, he's a prosperity preacher. You know, and I'm like, what am I? You know, like, wh why do you even talk about me? Why, why all this fight? You know, and it's just like, ah, I think just the enemy just wants us to fight and bicker and disassociate where God wants us so unified with the things that matter. But it starts here. And I don't want to just assume that with 48,000 people watching that you're ready to go on a mission because the truth is, is there's probably division in the home for a lot of you. And, and until you get on that right track of understanding and having a common mission to go home tonight and go, look, is this what we want? Are we after this? Do we have a goal in mind of I'm going to stand before God and we want to stand before him united, striving side by side for the sake of the gospel, like something bigger because I know sometimes when you get in an argument, those things seem so big, but nothing is going to be as drastic as standing before a holy God. I promise you, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And for that sake and that sake alone, we don't have time to fight. I, we just don't, the, the thought of divorce didn't even enter the mind. Why? Because I have a fear of the Lord at the core of my being. And it's like, we can't afford to fight. This life is too short, and we want to stand before him side by side, unified, having lived a life that actually meant something on this earth. And so, gosh, I really pray that you, you get over whatever is in between you because there's something bigger going on, and you can actually have an impact on other people's lives. You can actually keep people alive. You can actually expose them to the gospel. But this can sometimes get in the way of it rather than this being the very vehicle that brings that type of life into the world. So uh, let me just pray. Father, please. God, I know you hate it when your children fight and are divided. You hate a divided church. You hate seeing your children fighting like that, God. And it starts in the home, Lord. I pray for every husband and wife that's listening right now, that number one, they would have a fear and love of you, that they find their joy and security in you. 
God, heal every broken marriage. Use them for your glory. There are just too many people who are in need right now. There's no time to fight. Please unite these couples. Unite your church for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.